Uh, good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to present this case uh, uh, that will be um, a good example of our team uh, discussion. Um, so this is a 55-year-old uh, woman, active woman, with a medical history of uh, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, uh, obesity with a BMI at uh, 30 uh, for 68 kilos. She also um, uh, diabetes uh, treated by metformin, atrial fibrillation treated with uh, Eliquis, and she had uh, a vascular, peripheral vasculopathy with a clinical claudication. She also had a severe coronary disease. She had a coronary artery bypass in 1993 with uh, two memories on uh, LAD and uh, OM2 and a vein on the PDA. Uh, in 2012, uh, she had an enstemy treated by um, BMS on the uh, left main. In 2014, she, has, uh, also, she had also a BMS on the uh, obtuse marginal two. And this patient uh, had um, um, dyspnea, stat uh, two of uh, NYHA, and with a stable angina. She uh, never had a syncop, no diseaseness. <coughs> Um, I wrote no cardiac decompensation, decompensation but uh, at this time she was hospitalized for uh, pulmonary edema. Um, the other thing where uh, she is a self-independent person and she uh, nursed her husband who, um, who is an um, uh, Alzheimer person. Uh, she is still driving, she, has a li she had a light cognitive disorder but quite good uh, neurocognitive evaluation. She also uh, had um, pretty normal um, kidney function um, and uh, uh, quite good pulmonary test. The EKG um, is shown here, and as you can see, she has permanent atrial fibrillation. So the echocardiography revealed um, this in short axis. You can see the, probably a tree. Um, a, a tricuspid aortic valve uh, with uh, thin leaflets. And here in the long ax, uh, you can see that the valve uh, is not opening uh, very well. The LVRT was 19. And the uh, mean gradient was uh, uh, 34 millimeters of mercury, and the aortic valve area was 0.5 uh, centimeters square. Uh, the uh, LV function and the LV, RV, RV function was normal, were normal. She also had a mild AA, which could be um, um, a concern for later, and a mild uh, aortic ascending uh, dilatation. The other thing on the transthoracic echocardiography is um, this finding. As you can see, the mitral valve um, had uh, thick, thickened uh, leaflets and um, appeared to be calcified. And um, here you have the short axis and the posterior leaflet is not moving at all. Um, the mitral regurgitation severity was uh, qualified as uh, moderate to severe. The um, planimetry uh, showed that um, the metrovi was 3.3 .3 centimeters of mercury with a, mild, a mean gradient of 4. There, were, there, there is also a mild tricuspid regurgitation, and the pulmonary pressure uh, was uh, uh, 40 millimeters of mercury. So to uh, summarize, we had a severe aortic stenosis. We had a mild to moderate mitral uh, regurgitation with uh, probably a de degenerative mechanism. And we also have a moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation. LV and RV were uh, normal. So we obviously, we did a coronary angiogram that revealed the native cor coronary arteries at the severe um, atherosclerosis. And uh, as you can see, the LED is uh, occluded. Um, 
the here you can see the native uh, um, obtuse marginal and circumflex. The right coronary is totally blocked, and there is uh, some uh, collateral on the inferior wall. And interestingly, at the time, in 1993, she had a right internal mammar uh, artery on the LAD, which uh, crosses the sternum. Um, and the left uh, mammary artery was, uh, um, was bypassed in the, in the obtuse marginal. Both are, were, per, were uh, patent, and the uh, cabbage on the uh, PDA was uh, totally occluded. So at this time, it will be interesting to have a um, few comments or um, hypotheses about the strategy to treat this patient. <coughs> You know, or right, it seems like it's right across. There is no mm -hmm. kink, but does it cross behind the aorta? The or in front. Looks like it's in front. Yeah. Oh, okay. The, okay. This is the CT scan. Well, sure. <laughs> um, I guess from a surgeon perspective, it's um, it's a really tough case. <laughs> um, this this rema to the right across is likely going to be injured, at least in the way for the. Reentry, um, and then some of the highlights from a surgical perspective is the um, calcification mitral valve. So you're gonna have you have to address that. Um, the, um, the the aortic valve, I'm not too worried about, but the these two features, the two first one are gonna be putting patient at high risk of, of an issue. Now you could. Uh, you didn't show right heart cath or CT the measurements to decide, you know, suitability for. For TAVR, but you could potentially, you can have high gradient for high filling pressures um, alone. So while the valve is calcified, it's moving some. You could decide to just treat the aortic valve and then see what happens on the mitral valve. Um, that's what I probably would do and, and gather information about about the pressures on the left side, see if it's driven by high wedge or. Um, even but if, case, even yeah. if the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation is degenerative, you, you should Yeah, I mean, you can have pressure overload. The LV filling pressure is real high. I mean, you, 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 their symptoms are heart failure related. This is someone that perhaps has a, if has a percutaneous option, that would be a better mm -hmm. option. So, you know, I totally agree. At our center, this lady would be presented for, for TAVI if there's an access route. Well, I mean, obviously, she's double valve, possible concern of the, the REMA. Um, so TAVI, in my sense, would be preferable. Uh, and, you know, her pulmonary pressures aren't that high. They're, they're mildly elevated. And there's a reasonable chance that fixing the, the TAVI will see some improvement in the pulmonary pressures. Yeah, and, so, you know, th these patients are not uh, <coughs> atypical. We, they're actually very common. One out of three patients undergoing TAVR has uh, significant mitral regurgitation. And, um, you know, of course, it's not uh, a contraindication to do TAVR in someone with severe MR um, or moderate uh, MR, but uh, we do know that they don't do well at, uh, at one year. They have an increased mortality. Um, so, um, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a potential treatment option for the MR as well, but um, I agree with the, uh, with the panelists so far that uh, we would probably start with the transcatheter option, replace the aortic valve, and see what happens to the mitral valve. Some, uh, some of the concern of, uh, <coughs> of treating the aortic valve uh, first would be, I don't know the opinion of the surgeon, because that, that valve is, uh, the mitral is calcified and it would be hard to do a TAVI, uh, to do a mitral clip uh, was that if you deployed uh, a TAVI in the aortic position, can you go back later on because you have problem or issues with the mitral valve and, and retract the left atrium without compressing the TAVI, without folding it in two or dislodging the aortic prosthesis? Any, any people have uh, experience with you know, going for a mitral with a TAVI in place? Yeah, I've done that once. Um, it's not a, not a fun operation, but the concern is displacement of, the, of that. Now, you would think that perhaps this area would be fixed a little bit with that amount of calcium, uh, but it is, it is a concern, and um, you have to be ready to, to change it out, you know. Um, 
but I've done it. If through the right chest, it's actually a little bit easier, I think. Perhaps you don't have to pull as much to see. Uh, did it fibrillating uh, this time. Uh, the story doesn't end well, but at least the operation itself was successful. Um, so I did fibrillating with the long retractor. Because I had a similar case to reoperate. It was a core valve, and with the skirt of the valve go, uh, impinging quite a bit onto the uh, aortomitral continuity and uh, even reaching the anterior leaflet. And, uh, and I struggled a bit to how I would approach it. And finally, you know, there was some paravalvular leak on the, on the core valve. So I ended up you know, doing stenotomy and taking out the core valve and, and doing both mitral and aortic. But uh, I think the core valve represents a bigger challenge, too, because that under aortic annulus squirt, skirt is going to be a, it's always a little you know, larger. I, I was going to comment, uh, yeah, same, you know, you got to look at your depth of implant um, because, you know, uh, we, there's a great variability in the depth of implant. So the higher implant, of course, the less you are uh, away from the aortomitral continuity. But also maybe what might influence uh, your surgery is, uh, or the dislodgement that you're concerned about is one, if you have a balloon expandable versus self-expandable. Uh, and second, the time from your implant, because at six to 12 months, these valves are, as you've seen on surgery, probably are pretty well endothelialized. Uh, and there may be a, a lesser risk to dislodge or displace the valve. So, so it, it actually brings up an interesting uh, comment. The, you know, we, we've had now a number of occurrences where <clears throat> we've had either mild MR or uh, no MR, uh, done the TAVI, uh, needed to do either a balloon expandable or post-dilate a self-expanding, and run into, uh, yeah, MR sort of three, six months that is rearing its ugly head. Uh, and, and even one where we've had an existing um, uh, uh, a mechanical prosthesis where we've got paravalvular leak on the mechanical MR. And we, we do that with surgery. If, you, if you're a little too deep on that curtain, you'll create MR with distortion of mitral valve, and so it's not, it's not seen, you know, at least on our, on our part. We didn't open my open sapient to on these patients who fibrillate to the right chest and you deploy a sapien directly under direct vision. Uh, that may be requiring a little less work than a than a couple of stitches in that area there. Um, uh, we've had a couple of cases, but few have been successful. Because among those valves, um, that's, that's a bit of functional MR. You know, the patient has quite a bit of, of heart failure symptoms, and that mitral valve looks pretty beaten up. You know, it's very calcified. You, you know it's going to be part of the issues. So, so part of our uh, question mark was, you know, if that valve looks so uh, disease, should we not do, avoid the right IMA, do a left thoracotomy, replace the mitral valve? I, I would not do the aortic valve myself and then, and then have a TAVI done, either in the same procedure or a couple of days later on, uh, and then you have fixed the whole problem in a, you know, in a nice sequence. Yeah, this is a, a very nice option sometimes to do hybrid approaches to the to the valve disease. You know, we, we're starting to see this in PCI and uh, to do uh, hybrid approaches. And I think we need to be a little bit more open nowadays about uh, hybrid valvular approaches. This would be a, you know, potential case for, like you say, a minimally invasive mitral valve surgery uh, with a TAVR in place. <coughs> So, so Chris and Jean-Michel, uh, you guys uh, work out of hospitals that are extremely well known for how you take uh, good care of valve patients. How would this be approached? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we would uh, treat the aortic valve first and then see if, how does the mitral valve um, go. Um, and then consider probably a minimally invasive procedure. I would, I would favor uh, a balloon expandable valve. Uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, patient, if uh, I were to do uh, a TVR, we yeah, I mean, I think we would talk about it for a long time, and then we ended up we ended up doing a TAVI, and then wait and see what happens to the mitral valve. I, I don't think we've done a uh, uh, we've done hybrid cases uh, post post hoc, um, and I think that. Um, I think everybody would just let's keep our fingers crossed and see if we can if we're going to reduce the MR uh, you, by fixing the aortic valve. Do the life threatening and then, valve first, and then and then bite the bullet if you have to. I think that's would, kind of our, our. What kind of valve would you use? 
I would I would use a I would use a sapien here. I would use a balloon expandable one just for those reasons. I want to make sure I've got a. I'm not going to interfere with the um, the mitral aortic junction. So, so, so just, would, just oh. to play devil's advocate, why would you be concerned with using a core valve here and getting a, a decent height? Is this recapturable? You can reposition and. Yeah. Is, is it have to do with the surgery that you're going to do, or just because of your height? Uh, I think I, I think because of the possible surgery. I, I, I think. So, so for the surgeons, do you care if you have a, um, a, a core valve or a balloon expandable valve in place when you repair the or re replace the mitral valve? I think it's more difficult if you have a core valve in place. Why? Um, just because also like because of the exposure and also because like the strut can impinge on the anterior leaflet of the mitral. But if it's in, in a good height, you're okay? Yeah. But that's what I would uh, prefer. We had a couple of cases like that, and we tried to find the best way to do it. So at the beginning, we start by doing a simultaneous uh, procedure. So basically, when we inflated, the tr so we put the transcatheter valve in the mitral position because of the um, excessive amount of calcium in the mitral annulus. So we inflated the mitral valve at the same time as the aortic valve. Um, but it didn't work well in terms of position of both valves. So what we're doing right now, it's either do mini thoracotomy and uh, mitral valve replacement or repair on the right side uh, via right minute thoracotomy or and after we stage it and we place the transcatheter aortic valve after and we place it high maybe 90 10 or 80 20 and we uh, prefer to use a balloon expandable valve when we do it any way you see this this is a very complex case <laughs> you know if you if you my experience with mitral stenosis for the right chest is they're not easy operations you're trying to sit the valve and calcium and and so, you know, while it's interesting to debate whether core valve is, I mean, it's in, I think, like Jessica commented, and you're going to think about it, but altogether, it's going to be horrible. You know, it won't be a fun operation. Um, we can move forward and have some uh, more data on this patient. So we are almost totally agree that we will trade the ART valve with the with the TAVA. So uh, we have to access. Uh, the vascular uh, access, and uh, here you have the femoral uh, artery on the right side, and uh, the minimal diameter in this side was two millimeters because of huge uh, calcifications. It was almost the same on the left side. So the femoral access were, um, is uh, probably not a good idea in this uh, in this case. Um, the other uh, alternative, the right subclavian artery, uh, which is uh, also calcified at the uh, at the at its uh, ostium, and the diameter was measured at two millimeters or so. Uh, probably the right subclavian artery is not a good idea because of the uh, mammary artery on the, uh, the LAD. So, what about carotid uh, access? Um, both internal carotid arteries had uh, severe stenosis, but uh, common uh, carotids are almost um, pretty good. So to summary uh, the, the, um, the findings for uh, vascular access, um, femoral access is not available, subclavian is not available. So only carotid left with uh, probably a high uh, challenging risk of uh, stroke because of the bilateral stenosis of internal car carotid. So now that we had a consensus that uh, TAVI was going to be the first step, is this all good for everybody? Um, well, it's certainly not good news. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's not going to be an easy peripheral access. I don't think, you know, given the REMA, I don't think it would change my primary goal of trying to do it trans apically, perhaps. Yeah. Um, the, what's the size of the LVOT and annulus? Because it sounds like your LVOT was small. Because the other thing I would be very concerned if you take an approach where you, you explode the, the root or the, you know, the LVOT, and then you're going to do an urgent reoperation in someone that was not an operative candidate, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, this might be one for a trans cable as well. Uh, although looking at the uh, CT, it didn't. It wasn't sure if there was any areas where there wasn't any where there was calcium where you could cross over. You'd have to look at it closely. But I mean, that's an option for these types of patients. The the other thing we would look at 
considering that the patient doesn't have any uh, any good access, and uh, we would consider the uh, transapical access is uh, to look at the um, the calcium around the uh, the mitral valve to see if there is uh, circumferential calcium. If there is severe circumferential calcium, then we could do a transapical procedure, treating the aortic first, and then doing a, a TAVI inside the mitral calcification. Yeah, and that's thinking outside the box. Yeah, on T. There was a leaflet calcification or thickness, but uh, the annulus is not so calcified in CD or in coronary angiogram. Uh, well, you're calcified, your iliac may be okay. If you would have a high access, you know, you would be able to use the iliac. Perhaps even, I mean, it looks pretty straightforward. It's calcified, but you have a mm. seven millimeter iliac. Where yeah, this stenosis are quite Fo uh, focal, so maybe a stand before or angioplasty before, so I don't know. Where exactly was the stenosis, the two millimeter uh, vessel? Uh, more or less, more or less, it's okay, you don't have to show yeah. us, but was it uh, at the common femoral? Or the yeah, uh, on the right side, it's, um, it's uh, on the femoral, uh, on common femoral artery. So maybe, but you have to go in the... Yeah, but if the, you go higher up, you'll yeah. have size. Yeah. Maybe you can do a surgical cut down and, yeah. and get some femoral access. And, uh, in, in, on the left side, it's also the femoral, common femoral, but also in the... Would in you, the if, if you decide to go transapical, would you consider fixing both valves at the same time? As you're there? Bang, bang? There, not there's, the, probably not, not probably not enough, there's probably not enough, enough like calcium like on the mitral valve. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm not sure why, sorry, why you would even think about a transapical here. You, you have, uh, you know, the surgical cut down with high access, uh, you can go a transfemoral approach. Uh, and, you know, the, the data is very clear, it's equivocal, unequivocal, that this is the best outcome for these patients. Uh, if you start to move into an apical space, uh, you should be even considering surgery. Mm -hmm. so, so what about carotid? Is this something that's currently mainstream, or uh, any, any of us uh, do that? Carotid access for yeah, we, we've done a couple of uh, carotid accesses. Um, you know, there it's a very nice surgical exposure uh, based on what the, the experience of our surgeons has been. Uh, it's very superficial, uh, and um, you know the vessels are pretty uh, easy to repair apparently. Um, and um, you know the uh, deployment is pretty straightforward as if it were from any other access. So you know we typically enjoy it. It's a it's a you know outer thoracic vascular access and. Uh, that provides uh, good, um, you know, good access to the valve. So, in in this case here, you have, uh, you know, there's, you, you'd be obviously occluding one of the carotids during the case, uh, and you have a significant stenosis. I'd like to also know what's happening in the vertebral arteries in this patient, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, you know, it wouldn't be an attractive carotid case. Surprisingly, now, well now the king. <laughs> Yeah, it's very reluctant to start but, with. But it's, it's in fairness, yeah. yeah, the, the stroke effects. risk, Nico, in recent series is what, 4-5%? or five percent? Probably 4-5%, or five percent, yeah. yeah. So that's double what you would expect in this right. other yeah, it's so the, the, yeah, the trade-offs. Yeah, I think we have a comment from the audience. I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, this I is... Think uh, Mark Peterson. This is Mark Peterson. Uh, the, the other option is to access the anominate artery. Uh, we've done that about 10 to 12 times. Um, it depends on the anatomy. You'd have to look at it more closely. The size looked okay. Some anom anomalies come up and then take a 90 degree turn and, and then uh, go off to the right side and then start going back up into the neck. But some anomalous arteries co come straight up and you can actually access them with, by making a small incision over the suprasternal notch. It's, a good, it's usually a good sized artery. It's 12, 13 millimeters. Uh, even small amounts of calcium you can work around and it's, so it's direct access to the valve. Um, and it's big enough so that there's blood flow through, around the sheath so you're not occluding one side of the blood flow to the brain. And, but in the other half of the experience, we've had to use this device that's, uh, it's available, it's, it allows basically illuminated uh, retraction. It's, like a, it's almost like a mediastinoscope. And through that device, you can actually access uh, any anominate anatomy and you can access the aortic arch itself and the proximal or the distal ascending aorta. So it's a way to do basically a direct TAVR, direct aortic TAVR without opening the sternum or the chest. Um, it's challenging to 
the first few cases, but once you get used to it, it's actually pretty simple. It's a, basically a purse string, like a, any surgical purse string, and then the rest of the case is a very easy case. What's the device called? Is it the one from uh, Belgium or uh, uh, Netherlands? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the Aegis uh, suprasternal retractor. It was developed in uh, North Carolina. And I think it could, it's a, well, it, it's <coughs> available in Canada. Okay. It's a different sheet. Yeah. Yeah, with all those uh, morbidities described from all the, the different peripheral access, I would probably look again at the chest CT, see exactly where is the right IMA compared to the sternum, and rethink whether we should not do the complete surgery as we have done for many years to uh, reduce sternotomy. Can you show us the, the distance? Because there was some space on the CT scan, right? Yeah. 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 There. Yeah, there might be a centimeter between the right IME and the sternum. So that's, you know, if we're sort of dealing with carotid, which has already some disease uh, in there, it's all pretty morbid. So if, if we can do a safe sternotomy, that might be the option is to do traditionally. Um, what would be your strategy, Denis, for uh, myocardial protection? That would be very difficult in some ways, right? You get yes and it. no. You, you can uh, you, you can either uh, isolate the IMAs and and block them to so uh, that the cardioplegia is not flushed away by the patent uh, IMAs, or you can just let them run and uh, and maybe give some retrograde at the same time. So you would be a bit flooded for the aortic valve, but you can always put a sutureless valve where, it, where there's not much work to do uh, into the uh, root of the aorta. What would you do? I'd probably do the same. I, I think the angiogram would worry me in terms of native uh, blood flow, so I would probably keep the mammaries open because I, I think patients depend a lot on that circulation. And I would probably put a retrograde. I'd probably do the mitral transeptal and put a retrograde in there through the case. So we have a full team from Sacre Coeur Hospital. Anybody wants to comment how this would be done uh, in Sacre Coeur? <coughs> oh, we have Ig coming up to the podium. Um, the full team is there. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting case. I, I think for, for my experience, I would go with the knee on this one. And because I, I look at the mammary artery, the right, it seems to have a nice working space under the sternum. So with all the other comorbidities and calcification that I see, I think I would go for a regular surgery for this patient and uh, same kind of protection that he has. Because the mitral is, I don't think it's going to be that hard because it's not that calcified. And then you have a good access to the art also. OK. Great discussion. Okay. So just for the discussion, if you want to summarize, we also had the medical uh, treatment alone. So always available, uh, not so much cost, but uh, I think this combination of disease is uh, probably the worst and uh, the prognosis of this patient is not very good. So um, if I understand, maybe conventional surgery would be a re retained, if I would be the, the uh, option uh, who, with the most uh, suitable for this patient. Um, Tavi alone, it was uh, discussed. Um, just again, this, um, this strategy is de degenerative MR, but uh, could be also an uh, attempt. The hybrid approach with the um, first minimally invasive mitral valve repair or replacement, uh, followed by a Tavi with a through a carotid or high iliac access could be also done. Um, there is many challenges for the um, metroid valve repair through the thoracotomy um, first. And um, <coughs> we didn't discuss uh, the full um, the total percutaneous strategy um, with the mitral clip, but uh, the, the valve, the mitral valve wasn't uh, um, good for that. So that's what. Uh, so uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist, not doing structural 
uh, but I get involved on a regular basis to revascularize these patients. Now, I'm kind of interested in knowing how important revascularization is in those patients. Um, can we just go around the panel maybe and some, maybe in the audience say what, how you feel about revascularization in these patients? Do we need to go uh, as complete as possible? Do we need to do limited? Do we need to uh, look for symptoms? Uh, what exactly is the overall sense uh, of the panel? We look for symptoms uh, first, but also if they have a significant lesion of the LED, we prefer to do it first. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, based on the evidence we have and just anecdotal experience, I don't think we really know the answer. Uh, that's why we're conducting randomized trials in this field. Uh, at the moment, they're enrolling in something called the ACTION trial, um, and they're trying to randomize patients with a coronary disease to TAVR plus revascularization versus TAVR without revascularization. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and it's a whole different kettle of fish compared to uh, putting a patient under bypass and getting them off bypass and having to revascularize and not revascularize. So, um, you know, our current uh, practice right now is just to revascularize a very proximal disease if there's a mid PDA lesion or um, you know, some mid-OM lesion that's of uh, small to medium caliber, we might just leave it. Uh, but if there's a proximal, and of course it also depends on the patient's age and, and symptoms, but overall, uh, you know, we, we tend to le let go of uh, what we think is small territory arteries with significant lesions. I, I totally agree with, with what Nico said. I, I don't think that we should use uh, symptoms to base our decision to revascularize a patient or not, because and the, the presence of angina to determine if there is a coronary disease or not has a sensitivity and a specificity of less than 50 percent. It has been clearly sh uh, shown in the literature, so I wouldn't use uh, the symptoms. The other thing that is that we, um, th there was a, a paper um, by Nico van Meegen that showed that incomplete revascular, that complete revascularization is not mandatory in, in this uh, elderly patient population before TVR. And the last thing I wanted to say is that we recently uh, published uh, our experience uh, uh, looking at the, um, the complexity and the uh, severity of coronary disease and the impact of such coronary disease before TVR. And we, uh, we categorized our patients into uh, uh, no CD, low syntax score, intermediate syntax score, and high syntax score. And, and in, in fact, the syntax score, uh, even if it's high, has absolutely no impact on the outcomes after TVR. So, so uh, we, we don't need complete revascularization. And our, our uh, tendency right now is to, to be less and less aggressive with coronary disease. I, I just want to add that sometimes, you know, it might influence our valve type selection. Absolutely. If someone has, you know, quite significant coronary disease that we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, fix at, at the time of valve replacement or before valve replacement. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's cases where you can get access with, uh, with core valves and cases where you cannot. Uh, we were just discussing this during lunch. Um, so, yeah, it, it might influence uh, at times. Mr. Surgeon, by the um it's amazing what stuff we learn, you know. We sound like we've been doing aortic valve replacement without thinking as much, but the, um, we know in aortic valve surgery, if you don't fix coronary disease, that's a marker of having problems moving forward. Now, whether that's extensive because you're going on pump, because you're submitting patients to a surgery, we know it's a, pay, it's a price to pay if you're not revascularizing something that needs to be fixed. That's one. The other thing is, the other person that is really active in our center is Rick Nishimura and thinks about these things a lot. And he's, he said that if he cath these people afterwards, oftentimes lesions that were not functionally significant become significant when you relieve the, you relieve the narrowing. Now maybe that's overthinking, but he's, he's seen some patients get worse from a coronary disease standpoint after you fix the aortic valve. There was a, uh to add to that, there was a, a paper recently published in Circ Intervention look, looking at the at the FFR uh, before in, in, in intermediate lesions, looking at the FFR before TVR and right after TVR, and only eight percent, like only one patient was had to be recategorized after TVR. So if your FFR is actually positive. Uh, before TVR, it will see, still be positive after, after, and if the FFR is negative, then it will still be negative, uh, statistically speaking, after TVR. So, so let me just add that I agree with the pragmatic approach until we have good data. And being pragmatic with long wait lists, uh, 
you know, sometimes you relieve the coronary burden, ischemic burden, and the patients are less symptomatic for a brief period of time because they're not waiting just 40 days, they're waiting three months to six months. Sam, uh, do you use FFR in your AS patients? We tend not to, no. No. Just a, um, a, another uh, question on the presence of coronary disease with aortic stenosis. Uh, our patients often come to the lab for their angiogram before having seen the surgeon and before the final uh, opinion of the TAVI team. We find significant coronary disease that we feel needs revascularization, and sometimes we will revascularize even if we know that the patient is going to be chosen for a standard uh, aortic valve replacement. Do the surgeons appreciate that, or do they uh, feel uh, that that's uh, inappropriate? Well, I don't, um, I don't care as much, you know, my, 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 when I'm, and I'm happy to hear with Jessica and Denny Field, but when I make a decision about a patient on going an aortic valve replacement, I don't need an angiogram. You know, and so I see the patient. The patient seems to be a high-risk candidate, or I mean, I'm considering TAVR. And, and, and when I see patients in clinic, I assess the aortic valve, and then they get a preoperative angiogram. And then I add bypasses if I need to. And so, but I've made that decision. Now, this point about getting all the testing prior to getting a consultation with a surgeon is a well-taken one, because that's a new paradigm shift, right? People get tons of tests, and I've had recently a patient came to me, and she is an AVR, not a TAVR candidate, and she got all the testing and had stents in the circumflex and plavix, and I told her, you need an AVR. And she, her, her question was, Did I, do I need more testing? <laughs> I'm like, I think you got enough. I think you're good. And so, but, but this change in paradigm should, should, what I need to make to make a decision on surgical candidacy I don't need to calculate the SDS risk score. Maybe we do for these trials and things. That's a change in paradigm we didn't have to calculate to worry about before. Now we do have this technology now so we need to think about it. But, but I think there's value to have before we stand, we stand these patients a approach team so they say, well, what is the best route for this patient? Where is it going to be? Having an angiogram that shows moderate disease is not going to kick the patient to a significant risk score. I'll make my decision different. So, Simo, I just wanted to ask, so if you have someone with a, a moderate syntax score, um, would you mind if they would get PCI before surgical aortic valve mind. replacement? Mm -hmm. I even keep the Plavix on. I don't, I don't really care about that. Okay. If they're, they're re-ops, I'd um, care about it. <laughs> First time operation, I wouldn't. I think there's a paradigm shift, like Simon said, and I think that the screening of those patients prior and after ordering the test and after discussing in a team, even if he's not like a high risk or inappropriate risk patient, I think it's, especially for those patients for now, but I think uh, I would appreciate that um, better than sending the patient with the stents in place. I, I think it does complicate and somewhat yeah. because you need to deal with the plavix. You need to deal with the fact that you're going to mobilize the myocardium quite a bit and squeeze the heart uh, and probably mobilize the stents or compress the stents and then don't know whether you need to do a grafts or no grafts on the coronary. So, uh, so, so my first choice you know, would be uh, not, to, uh, not to have the dilatation or the, the stenting done before and makes makes the whole procedure simpler. You know what you need to do and are not trapped in grafting and not grafting the freshly stented coronary. I, I guess it's a matter of timing then because, you know, the, the data is pretty consistent that isolated AVR is a lower risk procedure than, than cabbage plus AVR, uh, and the, you know, on the whole. So, um, if you're planning to go for this patient soon, probably it's the right thing not to, but uh, it's, it's for debate. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's for debate. I mean, the, the, the data is completely different patients. It's aorta plus aortic valve plus bypasses versus aortic valve. What we're talking about here is aortic valve with previous stenting versus, you know, and you're comparing apples and oranges, really. It's different diseases. So, but. There's really no data supporting one way or the other. Um, but, I, but if you're a minimally invasive surgeon, you may want to have a few things stented. The OM with a vein graft is 
probably the same with the stent, and, and a mini AVR is probably better recovery for patients, and so you're not mobilizing things as much and, and things like that. We need hybrid ORs.